I'm a historian at a decently large museum. I won't say where since this story involves some artifacts we're technically not supposed to have. My background, aside from the history of wars in the 1800s and 1900s, is in chemistry and photography, so I mostly work on old film and photographs. And this whole story started when I was given a box full of film, which had been discovered in a basement among some crates, which hadn't been touched since the interwar period, as far as anyone could tell. The cache of film, papers, and war trophies was strangely well preserved, despite the dampness in the basement. I was excited to work with this film, since it used some different chemistry from most photographic film. I won't get into the technical details, but most film uses silver-based, light-sensitive compounds. This was only maybe 20 years after the first moving image was captured on film though, so there was still some experimentation going on, and I was told what was in the box used a very rare set of chemicals. I won't say what they were for reasons that will soon become obvious. When I opened the box, I was immediately disappointed. Rather than negatives or developed frames, the box contained undeveloped film, placed in thick envelopes labeled in French. I was sure that, after over a hundred years, anything on it would be long gone. But much to my surprise, after waiting some weeks to get the required chemicals, the negatives were crystal clear. The first strip was barely 10 seconds long, and appeared to show a forest behind a house in the countryside. The second, however, was a stark change in tone, footage from a World War I field hospital. It was getting close to the end of my workday at the museum, but I figured I'd stay longer to see what I could find. Most of what I found was either the French countryside or scenes from inside trenches, barracks, and hospitals. As bulky as moving picture cameras were in that era, footage from an actual battle would be an incredibly rare find, and I figured any footage of training would have been used for propaganda rather than stuffed in a basement. As the time passed, something about the footage which was still just a strips of still frames was making me uncomfortable. With the job I had, I'd seen a lot of photos and footage of violence and suffering, but this was something different. I couldn't explain it in terms of what I was seeing. Nothing was visually off about the film, which was almost mysteriously unaffected by its long time in the basement. But a few hours in, I was getting a gnawing pit in my stomach looking at the idyllic countrysides and muddy trenches, so I decided to call it quits. It was already dark outside, though it was barely past 6.30. As I walked to the train station, my nerves calmed a bit. I wasn't sure why I'd felt so on edge. Maybe the long hours were just getting to me. The next morning, I arrived bright and early excited to show some of the other museum staff the images I'd developed. They were as amazed as I was that the undeveloped film had preserved so well, but they also seemed slightly unsettled. One of them, a friend of mine, abruptly left, seeming a bit agitated. I ran into another in the break room at lunchtime, but when I mentioned the film, she recoiled slightly and barely replied when I tried to talk to her. By this point, and after developing more of it and feeling the strange unease again, I was really starting to get concerned. I started to think that maybe the fumes from the developing chemicals, which were different from those in the normal process, could be having some sort of effect. So I placed a fan outside the dark room entrance and found a gas mask to put on, perks of working in a war museum. Soon after, I developed a strip of film with a slightly strange label, ombre, meaning shadow. Most of the others were more descriptive with a place name and a date. The envelope had been opened before and folded back shut, unlike the rest. Once it was developed, I examined the negative. It showed a British soldier leaning up against a trench wall, 
with a dark stain on his uniform, sitting still. But what caught my attention was a strange shadow hovering over the man. In the negative, it was ghostly white. I was suddenly hit by the dread I'd felt before, but far worse. I felt like I had to get out of the lab, so I did. I burst out and ran straight into my coworker, knocking her to the ground. She yelped, not expecting a man in a gas mask to lunge out of the dark room. I took it off and apologized profusely. She looked like she was about to ask me something but changed her mind and stood back up to resume rummaging through a crate. After the intense feeling I'd gotten out of nowhere after seeing the last strip of film, I was reluctant to return to the dark room, but I felt duty bound to finish developing the contents of the box even if the film had lasted as long as it did. Who knows, moving it to another microclimate could destroy it rapidly. This time, I didn't look at any of the negatives more than I had to. I only gave them the slightest of inspections and put them straight into new envelopes. I didn't think of myself as a cowardly person, but something about those stills was deeply horribly off. I was scared to catch a glimpse of them, but when I did, the shadowy figures were appearing more often. One strip was from a field hospital, and a whitish smudge floated in front of a soldier lying in one of the beds. In another, the smudge was barely visible for a few frames, floating by one of the corners. I even started having nightmares. I bolted awake one night, sure I'd seen something dark standing just over me. When walking to my bathroom at night, I could almost swear something was looming off to my side just beyond my peripheral vision. Finally, I'd had enough. I wanted to know what the smudge was. I ordered some chemicals from a supplier overseas and mixed them together with gelatin. I spread the mixture over some clear plastic, effectively creating the same film I'd been developing hoping I could recreate the effect and figure out if it was some chemical process that was responsible. I loaded it into an old film camera I owned, as part of a collection, and snapped a photo of the woods behind my house. The next day at work, I developed it. It came out fine and there was no blurry dark cloud to be seen. The next weekend, I tried once more. It was a rainy day and pretty dark outside. I decided to try the film in different light conditions, starting with a lonely tree against a dark sky. As I was framing the shot, I got the familiar twisting feeling or horror in my gut. I fought through it and snapped the photo. I turned around and decided to take one of the bird bath in my backyard. As I looked through the viewfinder again, I felt my own vision darken and I awoke a few minutes later, the heavy camera on top of me and my wife shaking me. I decided that was plenty of photography for the day. I had a gut feeling I shouldn't have developed the photos I took that day, but I was stubborn. I had to know. So I started with the lonely tree. Once I saw the negative, a wave of shock hit me. The negative had a mysterious white figure, but it wasn't a cloudy blob. It was clearly a human form, crumpled beneath the tree. I looked closer and morbidly curious and observed its head, twisted at an unnatural angle, as if he'd hit the ground from a fall. With grave determination, I started on the second image. I wasn't sure if I'd managed to take the photo or not before I fainted so I was half expecting a blank negative. But what I saw instead was a ghostly figure lunging out at me, both arms extended toward my throat. In the negative, it was a bright white, but in the final photo, I knew it would be a dark, shadowy figure. The feeling of doom crawling in my guts wouldn't go away, even after I hid the negatives under a tray, even after I slashed through them with a knife. I lodged myself into a corner of the dark room and tried to catch my breath. In the dim red lighting, 
I saw a shadowy figure approaching. I blinked a few times and it vanished. With nowhere else to turn, I dug through the envelopes in the box. My hand brushed against something small and heavy. I grasped for it, eventually coming up with a small glass bottle of a clear liquid. It had a cross on it. I pulled a tiny cork out of the bottle and, with no idea what to do with it, splashed it on the shreds of film lying on the floor. It hissed, and I instantly felt the despair retreat. I looked at one of the ripped up pieces and saw a part of my birdbath, a part which had been blocked by the shadowy figure. Finally, I felt a glimmer of something other than inescapable terror. I hunted down every scrap of film I could find in the dark room and poured the water over it. With every hiss, some strange detail would disappear, sometimes blobs I'd never even noticed in those countrysides. I slowly felt less and less scared, and as I splashed a few drops onto the final strip of film, I felt a wave of relief. I stumbled out of the dark room tired but safe. I hope it's clear why I'm not sharing what the composition of the light-sensitive compound was. It seems it's sensitive to something else, something that we're not prepared to see. I didn't dare develop any more of the footage, but from what I had that had been doused in the bottle's contents, I found a few scenes that were worth putting in a projector to show the museum goers. I haven't had any scary encounters with ghostly figures in a while now, but it certainly made me a little cautious about what comes next. <laughs>